Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. We're glad to have you here today for this event. Um, thank you for taking time out of your afternoon to spend uh, some of it with us here at AEI, uh, where we are happy to welcome Harvard University President Larry Backow to present a uh, talk on his vision for the future of higher education in America, followed by a panel of very distinguished experts in the field. So we'll look forward to the discussion. Uh, I'd like to point out that this event is being co-sponsored with our neighbors, uh, the Brookings Institution, and we appreciate their support and help. And uh, Richard Reeves from Brookings will moderate the panel to follow President Backhouse talk, and I will let him introduce the uh, panelists at that time. Uh, this is being filmed. This is being live streamed. We welcome all of uh, those of you who are watching this from somewhere else at a desk or in your living room or your, your kitchen. And uh, we look forward to any follow-up that you want to provide us on how you think the event has gone. The, um, the topic t today on the future of a higher ed is on a lot of people's minds, and there's nobody more qualified to talk about that than, than President uh, Larry Bacow of Harvard University. He's one of higher education's more widely experienced leaders with quite a track record. Um, he's long supported scholarship and research, uh, encouraged civic engagement uh, through universities, and is committed to expanding opportunity for all. Uh, from 2001 to 2011, he was the president of Tufts University, where he fostered collaboration and advanced the university's commitment to excellence in teaching, research, and public service. Prior to Tufts, he was at MIT for 24 years, where he held the Lee and Geraldine Martin Professorship of Environmental Studies and served as the chair of the faculty and as chancellor. Raised in Pontiac, Michigan by two immigrant parents, uh, President Baca received his bachelor's degree from MIT and then, no stranger to Harvard University, um, graduated from Harvard Law School, uh, earned an MPP from the Kennedy School at Harvard, and then a PhD from the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Prior to his election to the Harvard presidency uh, a year ago, he served as a member of the Harvard Corporation, the Hauser Leader in Residence at the Kennedy School, and a uh, president in residence at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Harvard University President Larry Bacow. Thank you very much, Ryan, for that very kind and generous introduction. It's uh, wonderful to be here with all of you today and to look out and see uh, so many old friends and co-authors and uh, people that I've had an opportunity to work with in, in many different capacities um, over the years. Uh, it's challenging to be asked to give my vision of the future of higher education and to do so in 10 minutes or less. Um, so uh, what I'm going to try to do is to explain why I think one should be humble about making such predictions and then also try and lay out what I see as some of the challenges which we we confront today in higher education. And then hopefully when uh, Richard gets us up here on the panel, we can all discuss some of these challenges because I don't profess to have um, all of the answers, although I do have um, a few opinions. Uh, one of the wonderful things about spending one's life in Boston is that it's one of the few cities in the nation where the dominant institutions are the universities and the nonprofits. Higher education is to Boston, what finance is to New York, what automobiles are to Detroit, steel is to Pittsburgh, the entertainment is, industry is to LA. So people tend to pay a lot of attention to what's going on in higher education in Boston. And indeed, you can't pick up a newspaper and, without reading about something. Uh, what's been interesting is that recently, every time you pick up a copy of the Boston Globe, and in fact, the lead story in today's Globe is on precisely this topic, what we are reading about is some local college or area institution that is in the process of closing. Um, recently, Mount Ida College in Newton, Mass, closed. Green Mountain College in Vermont, closed. Uh, Wheelock College merged with BU and then basically went out of existence. And if you look at the front page of the Boston Globe today or go online, you will see there's an article about Hampshire College, uh, which has just decided not to admit a class uh, for next year and is teetering on the precipice, it appears, um, of bankruptcy. So what I want to ask is, is this the beginning of the end of a bunch of institutions as has been predicted uh, by a number of our peers? Uh, in fact, 
Uh, my colleague at the Harvard Business School, Clay Christensen, has made a forecast saying that half the colleges and universities in America will no longer exist 15 to 20 years from now. Uh, it's a pretty provocative statement. Um, Kevin Carey, who many of us know, Kevin has written and said, going to be a lot more institutions over the next 30 years which disappear than over the previous 30 years. Um, Terry Hartle has pointed out to me that people have making, been making predictions like this actually for a very long time about the impending collapse of American um, higher education. When I became president of Tufts, I decided I should learn something about Tufts, read some histories. So I read a very good book, which was written by Richard Freeland, later become, became president of Northeastern University, a really transformative president of Northeastern. And Richard is a historian of higher education. And he wrote a book um, that was entitled Academia's Golden Age, and it was about the Boston area research universities basically since World War II and, and how they have evolved. And in that book, I was surprised to read that in 1992, I became president of Tufts in 2011, he predicted that Tufts was going to be in steep decline and would face serious challenges um, going forward. No less an authority than Howard Bowen, who is, I think, known to many people in this room, predicted in his classic, The Finance of Higher Education, that our system of higher education was on an unstable trajectory. Why? Largely because of ever-rising tuition and student fees. When Howard wrote that, the average tuition at a private college in the United States was $3,000 per year. Um, I could go on. The point I want to make, at least to start out, is the sort of death of American higher education as we know it has been grossly overpredicted, um, and consistently so, and that the perception is that these great institutions don't change. But in fact, if you read histories of them, what you find is that they do change and adapt, and they change and adapt quite a lot, only on a time constant that's much longer uh, than many other institutions in our society that they are in fact quite durable and um, can adapt in some cases quite quickly, especially when they face existential threats. So I mentioned Northeastern a few minutes ago. Northeastern is a really good case in point. Northeastern for years was you know, just big commuter school in Boston known for its co-op program. It's actually one of the largest private universities in America. But in the late 1980s, early 1990s, Northeastern was literally teetering on bankruptcy. Uh, and John Curry became their president. He had been their executive vice president. He was not an academic. And he charted a new path for Northeastern, in which he shrunk the size of the entering class. He recommitted to cooperative education, which was Northeastern's calling card. It's what differentiated it from every other institution in Boston. He started to invest in the faculty and invest in more financial aid. Um, and in fact, he really put Northeastern on a different path. He was followed by Richard Freeland, who then committed to making Northeastern a residential campus. Uh, and then followed by another tremendously successful president, Joseph Aoun, who is at Northeastern uh, today. Northeastern was this close to bankruptcy. Uh, this is not an unusual story. Uh, in fact, there was a time in which NYU was struggling, had to sell off part of its campus to keep its doors open. Today, it's an institution that's flourishing. You know, Antioch was shut down and brought back from the dead. Sweetbriar, the same. And in fact, just this week, Bennett College seems to have survived uh, to live yet another day. Each of these institutions changed when they had to. Each had constituencies which were passionate about their survival and were willing to dig in and advocate for them and to contribute to them to change and adapt when they had to. Now, I, I tell this story only because I think it's hard to predict the future of higher education. And, and I'm not going to try and, and do that now. But I also don't want to be heard as saying that um, this sector 
that some institutions won't go under, they will. I'm also not saying that the sector is not facing substantial pressures and challenges. We are. Um, I'm just arguing that colleges and universities are far more adaptable and durable than some may give them credit for being. So what are the substantial challenges that I think we face? Here I need to couch my comments in a caveat. I've spent, um, as Ryan said, my entire career at highly selective um, research universities. That's what I know about. And so I want to talk largely about that, although I think in the conversation we will broaden it because there are people here who know a lot more than I do about other parts um, of, of higher education. Um, so I think that today, at this moment in time, we are confronting three major challenges. First, we are perceived as being elite institutions um, at a time in which the word elite has become a bad word when applied to anything but a quarterback. You know, okay to covet an elite quarterback, everybody, everybody gets that. But if you're elite in any other dimension, um, bad idea. Um, some people think that institutions like ours care far more about making themselves great than they do the world better. Um, and I think therein lies a challenge for us and we can talk about how do we in fact respond to that perception um, of elitism that's, that we are often saddled with. Second, I think there's public anger towards institutions like ours because people believe that we are too politically correct, that we lean left, that we do not truly embrace ideas from across um, the ideological um, spectrum. Um, and that we are, in fact, more than that, intolerant of other views. Now, I would, I'm going to editorialize here. We have never had a speaker shouted down um, at Harvard or somebody who was unable to speak. Uh, we have speakers from across the spectrum. This past year, Mitch McConnell, Betsy DeVos, Charles Murray, all spoke at Harvard um, without incident. Um, yet, having said that, there's a perception that certain folks cannot speak at a place like Harvard. We work very hard to counter that, but it's an issue for us. And third, I think a lot of the public anger over higher education is actually rooted in the ever-escalating cost and price uh, of a college degree. People believe that we are incapable of controlling our own costs, or worse, that we will charge what the market will bear because we can. Uh, and as the real cost of an education has increased, I think this has stoked cynicism um, and public anger um, over the higher edu education sector uh, more broadly. Now, uh, I think you know, we, we can talk about how we respond to each of these, but what's important to understand here is that all of public support for higher education is threatened by what I just described to you. And there is, no there is no institution of higher education in the country that is wealthy enough to exist without public support, and that includes Harvard University. Um, all of us are dependent upon public support for research support, for indirect cost recovery, for guaranteed student loans that allow our graduate students to finance their education. Um, we are dependent upon public support indirectly for the charitable deduction, uh, for the tax exempt status of our property, I could go on. So we ignore these criticisms um, at our peril. And ultimately, I think we need to engage and respond and address these in important ways. And, and I look forward to what I think will be an interesting conversation about, about how we do that. Uh, I've only been given 10 minutes, and I think I'm already pushing that. So let me just make two more comments, and then I'll sit down and we can have a conversation, not just amongst the panel, but I hope with all of you um, as well. Almost all of the discussion about what's wrong with higher education tends to be filtered through the lens of undergraduate education. But in fact, 
the kinds of institutions that I've been at, as well as the great public universities of this country, are research universities. And, and research and education are joint products. And we should never lose sight of that. Because it's easy to try and tinker with the undergraduate experience in ways to make it more accessible or to hold institutions accountable in ways to try and encourage broader access. And I'm not arguing against broader access or accountability. I believe in those. But when we do that, we need to be cognizant of the fact that we cannot kill the goose that laid the golden egg. Um, ironically, while the public may be angry about, with higher education for the way in which we educate undergraduates, they love our institutions when it comes to the research that we do, when it comes to the economic opportunities that we generate by the technologies that we create, by the companies that we spawn off. We live in a world in which the only truly scarce capital is human capital. Financial capital moves at the speed of light. One region no longer needs to be wealthy in terms of, or well endowed with natural resources uh, to be rich. It's the ability to aggregate and concentrate and create human capital that determines the wealth of nations and regions. And what the great research universities do is exactly that. We are the sink at the end of the rest of the world's brain drain. They send us their best and their brightest, and many of them never want to leave. And they stay, and they enrich not only our institutions, they enrich this country. 35% of the Harvard faculty were born someplace else, not in this country. 40% of the Nobel Prizes awarded to US citizens um, in the sciences in recent years have gone to US citizens who were immigrants to this country. When I was, uh, I looked up the data when I was chancellor, when I was chair of the faculty at MIT at the time, we had 13 Nobel laureates on the MIT faculty. It just so happened six of them were born outside the United States. So, you know, Pat Moynihan, uh, who was a longtime faculty member at Harvard, uh, a distinguished public servant in the United States Senate. And I have to add here, with some pride, as the former president of Tufts, all of his degrees were from Tufts. <laughs> but he said famously, if you want to build a great city, first build a great university, and then wait a few hundred years. And there's a tremendous amount of truth to that, because I challenge you to look around the world and find a great university, great research university anywhere that's not thriving, or the area around it is not thriving economically relative to the broader um, area. Um, so, you know, we need to, we need to preserve and protect um, the research function that is intimately bound up with the educational function. Finally, the last thing I want to say is I think it's really important that we get this right. When I say we, I don't just mean for those of us who are privileged to lead these institutions. I mean we as a society. Uh, as Ryan said when he introduced me, both of my parents were immigrants to this country. They were actually both refugees. My mother came on the second liberty ship that brought refugees from Europe after World War II. She was an orphan. She had survived Auschwitz. The only member of her family who survived, actually the only Jew from her town who survived the war. I often say, where else in the world can you go literally in one generation from off the boat with nothing, absolutely nothing, which was my parents, to enjoy the kind of life and opportunity that I've enjoyed? Historically, the nation's colleges and universities have enabled the American dream. It's important that all of us work to continue to ensure that opportunity exists for future generations, just as it was created for so many of us who are privileged to be sitting in this room. Thank you for being such an attentive audience. I look forward uh, to our conversation collectively. Thank you. Stage with President Bacow. Uh, my name is Richard. Larry, please. Larry. Um, President Bacow or Larry, you prefer Larry? Larry, I prefer sure? Larry. Yeah, absolutely. All right. In that case, I'm Richard. <laughs> uh, as Ryan said, it's a joint event between AEI and Brookings. I'm the director of our Future of the Middle Class initiative, um, and particularly focused on the extent to which higher education is serving those from the middle class. 
and helping more people to join the middle class in terms of upward mobility. Um, and so my role here is to moderate a discussion with some experts who are going to respond to Larry's comments, um, then give Larry a chance to respond to their responses, and then we'll move out after a moderated conversation to a Q&A with all of you. So let me add my thanks to you all for coming. Um, and to our panel for uh, joining. I just want to say something right up front, because it will be distracting otherwise, my socks. Those who can see the socks here. <laughs> and you may have noticed Ryan's too, is that for those who don't know, Arthur Brooks, who's the outgoing president of AEI, is well known for his colourful socks. And I think that as a tribute to Arthur, many of us are choosing to continue to wear these kind of colourful socks. Uh, it's a sort of sense of, wear these in remembrance of me. <laughs> of Arthur Brooks. So. <clears throat> So, anyway, I should have told you before. About Sorry that. about that. Yeah. So, we're, we're going to hear, I won't do the, the whole bio thing. We're going to hear from um, Sandy Baum, uh, who's from the Urban Institute. We're going to hear from Anthony Carnavali, who is a professor at Georgetown, and Michelle Weiss, who is the chief innovation officer at the Strata Education Network. They're going to give their brief responses to uh, Larry's comments. Uh, and then, we, as I said, we're going to move into a conversation. So, Sandy, I'm very much hoping that you'll be able to contextualize these comments. Uh, around the kind of issues of success and access more broadly in higher education, not only in the selectives, but perhaps the system as a whole. Sandy. Thank you. Let me just first say that I noticed your socks, so I'm really glad to have no, you. I wanted to clear, I wanted to clear <laughs> the air. It's good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So it was really wonderful to hear Larry's comments, and I think that it's really important for us to figure out how to place the role of Harvard and institutions like Harvard into the larger context, not just of will they survive, but what is their role in society. And we talk a lot about access and success, and in fact, the conversation has been as though those are two separate goals. And I would like to suggest that we should instead redefine access so that it has more meaning and it actually involves success at the same time. So historically, mm -hmm. we've thought about access as, do you have enough money to go to college, to some college, to, to get some way into higher education? If we could do that, we'd solve our problem. We've realized now that that's not enough, and now actually the pendulum has swung, and too much of the access conversation is about, can you go to Harvard or to a school like Harvard? And the answer is that neither one of those is right, that what we need is meaningful access to high-quality educational experiences in which students have a high probability of succeeding. So the first thing is students have to graduate from high school, and 8 to 10 percent of black and Hispanic men between the ages of 16 and 24 are not high school graduates or in high school or have no such credential. So what are we going to do about them? And then many people who graduate from high school are not college prepared, and then they don't know how to choose the right college, where to go, what to study, et cetera. There are lots of options that are, where they're not going to succeed. And then they get to college and they don't have the supports that they need in order to succeed. So access means having all of those things. And in order to do that, we're coming up with like uh, magic bullets. Maybe if we make it free, that will work. That won't make it work because what the problem is is that most of the institutions to which these students go don't have the resources to support and educate them. That's much more important to give those resources so they can succeed than to just cut the price a little bit. Mm -hmm. Getting a few more students to Harvard is a great idea, but that's not going to solve the problem because that's not where most students are going to go. Putting everybody online is not going to solve the problem because we know from experience that when underprepared students go fully online and don't have interaction with instructors, they don't succeed. So we have to think holistically about the solutions, what institutions like Harvard and other institutions with resources can do to help us solve these problems, and what we can all do, and how we should think of higher education as a broader and more integrated um, social institution. Right. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, Tony, I'm hoping you'll push a little bit on the equity angle. Um, Larry finished by saying higher education can help to make the American dream real, be this escalator of upward mobility. How, how are we doing on that front in the US? I think where we are, uh, and I think we're headed in the right direction, you can be impatient with the pace of it, but I think higher education is changing. Um, in the end, uh, I think where we are is that higher education is an institution that largely because of economic changes begin in the 80s, roughly, um, in a world where knowledge is capital and where upskilling occurred dramatically in, the, in modern economies, uh, that higher education became a mass institution in the United States. Uh, and it is uh, now, I think, arguably, uh, becoming a mature mass institution and as such, it's essentially uh, ripe for what economists would call rationalization. That is, we have what is effectively 
a $500 billion information machine, a $500 billion computer with no operating system. And that is largely, I suspect, the future of higher ed uh, over the next several decades is how we will uh, build out that operating system in the interest of two uh, consistent American goals, uh, one being efficiency, and that's a huge problem in higher ed, cost. Uh, we have a system in which uh, every institution has to be all things to all people, uh, has no capacity for specialization. Uh, we have a system that runs based on uh, the critters in the zoo or institutions uh, and uh, what are essentially uh, good old-fashioned guilds, uh, and we need to modernize that. My own bias is we do that by going below the institutional level and begin to run this system based on transparency at the program level. Uh, so in the end, there are these other issues. There's the one that Larry has to live with, which is that uh, it is apparent, I think, uh, that elite education in America uh, has become a very inequitable uh, system that is, is essentially permanent. What we're really doing is we are building an aristocracy uh, posing as a meritocracy, uh, and that it is beginning to pass on race and class privilege, mostly to whites, from one generation to the next. And that, in the long haul, is not tolerable in the American system. The higher education system has become a dual system in which more and more relative to population share, richer, more affluent whites are going to the elite schools. Uh, African Americans, Latinos, and working class Americans are going to that other system where the spending per student is many times less uh, and where the outcomes are understandably many times uh, less optimistic even for equally qualified students. So it is a, a system. My solution for all this is not so much what's ideal, because I have no idea. Uh, my solution is not so much, uh, and solutions don't tend to come, I think, especially in politics, don't tend to come full force. Uh, it's not about what's ideal. It's about what's next. And what's next clearly in higher education reform uh, is the sort of thing that Senator Lamar Alexander talked about a couple days ago, although I'm not sure of his specific proposal, uh, which is we got to start making the system transparent at the program level, allowing for more competition uh, in the production of programs. It'll cost you several billion, I have no idea how much money, but a lot. It'll cost you a lot of, many billions of dollars to make a new Harvard, uh, but it'll cost you 10 to 15 million to start a program. And so long as the program delivers, uh, learning and earning, uh, it should be available for public funding, in my judgment. Okay. Thank you. Um, Michelle, you're a chief innovation officer, so everyone looks to you to solve everything. Um, we've had this conversation thus far mostly within the constraints of the current institutional arrangements, community colleges, four years, etc. Um, is there a way we can innovate our way out of some of the challenges that Larry set out? Should we be thinking about a completely new model? And everyone got very excited about MOOCs and putting everything online, and that will be very inclusive, and that sort of that, seem, that bubble seems to burst somewhat. But on the innovation front, can you can you help us out? Yeah, the lens through which we we look at higher ed is through the future of work, and so as we try to better understand the needs of the workforce of 2030 or 2040. We are already sort of feeling the velocity of technological change. There's just, there's just sort of no denying um, how rapidly and, and exponentially uh, things are changing for us. And it's changing the nature of work. And it's also creating an enormous demand for uniquely human skills alongside technical skills for success in the workforce. And it's interesting, right, because as we think about one of the chief cultivators of those kinds of uniquely human skills, they are often conflated with liberal arts competencies, right? Critical thinking, communication, collaboration. And it's great that we have these institutions that function in that way to, um, to, to generate talent for the workforce. But then at the same time, we have, to, we have to sort of juxtapose what's happening in the traditional education system alongside the fact that we have so many working class Americans who are out of the system, who are being left behind. So by working class, I'm talking about the sub-associate degree level population 
who have a high school degree maybe um, are making just around uh, a living wage, but maybe a little bit less than $25,000 per year or less than $50,000 for a family of four. There are approximately about 32 million Americans who kind of count in this space of working class Americans, and they are out of this system. And it's not as though, even if perhaps they are in a, in a job where their skills, they can see their skills waning, we can't just sort of say, hey, go get some liberal arts competencies by going to an institution, go, to, go take a two or four year degree. That's just not an option. Um, so we know that for a well-functioning learning ecosystem of the future, we are not going to be able to depend on two or four years on the front end of a career to last us a longer, more turbulent work life. So what are the systems? What does the infrastructure look like? What does the architecture look like to facilitate more seamless movements in and out of learning and work? And that's where I, I, I would love to see more institutions engaged with really investing in the concept of a lifelong learner. I think everyone conceptually agrees that we all have to be lifelong learners. We are going to have to upskill, upgrade our skills throughout our working lives. But we don't actually see any of the investments going into that space. We don't actually see seamless ways in which you can take, out, take time off of work or or instead of doing everything on top of your existing work life and your caregiving responsibilities uh, to, 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 to make your way through um, that upskilling opportunity. And so I think this is, this is a unique challenge ahead. And you see a lot of innovation going on in this space. Um, there are some estimates that within just the last three years, between 2015 and 2018, we have generated a, an over $2.9 billion marketplace in, in workforce tech. And these are things that are trying to get at these informal workforce competencies, directing adult learners more, more directly to the workforce instead of pushing them into a two-year program or a certificate that does not guarantee a job. Um, so so there, there are really um, new innovative models that we are looking to um, that are on ramps to good jobs, especially for this foundational element of the learn, learning ecosystem that, that focuses on those 32 million Americans who are at risk of being left behind by the future of work. Thank you. Thank you all for your comments. Larry, I'd love you to respond. I mean, there's so much there that yeah. um, you could. I definitely want you to respond to this last point about lifelong learning because yeah. that's the sort of thing that people say on panels like this as a solution to pretty much everything. Yeah. Meanwhile, nothing really changes, but we all get to get off the panel. Right. Um, <laughs> but because we've used, we've used the magic words, oh, we just need lifelong learning. Right. Um, I think this point about we say it. So how do we get it from cliche to reality? Well, and what's your role there? So I think um, there are a couple comments. Um, Lifelong learning, I, 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 complete, com I agree completely with what Michelle said, um, but it works best, actually, after people have entered the system of higher education. The problem, as Sandy, I think, observes is that there are a lot of people who never make it there. It's interesting that we've gotten to this far in the conversation we haven't talked about the failures of K-12 through education, in, which um, saddle a lot of people with mm -hmm. Uh, problems before they, so that keeps them from ever thinking about getting um, a college education. Interestingly, uh, both at Harvard, actually at Tufts and at MIT, the three institutions that I've been at, and I think it's true, I'm, I'm looking over at Steve Trachtenberg, it's true at other institutions uh, as well. Among the fastest growing line items in our budget happens to be executive and continuing education. Um, the, the real impact of technology on the I think the is existing traditional institutions at this point has not been so much that we've used it uh, to educate a new group of students, although we have tried you know, through edX and Harvard X and things like that uh, for us, but the opportunity it gives us to maintain a connection with our graduates and to help them reskill and change as their professions and as their fields evolve. Um, I think that we need to think hard about the role of technology in reaching out to, to others beyond our, our institutions. There are many things which I think we can do. You know, we're certainly trying to do. As, as we think about uh, the impact of online learning, digital education, we should all recognize that we've had basically a thousand years to perfect what we're doing right now, sort of the sage on the stage, putting you know, a teacher in front of a whole bunch of students and having them convey knowledge to them. You know, we've been at the digital learning for a, an incredibly brief amount of time. What we know is that it will get better over time. We'll figure out how to, how to teach different subjects, um, you know, using the technology. 
we will solve the last mile problem, one of the, the, the barriers to reaching a broad swath of, of America through digital learning is that some, the poor don't have access to the technology uh, in, in many cases. We've got to solve that problem. But I think that um, you know, I'm optimistic at our capacity to, to reimagine the way in which we deliver education more broadly. I also want to make um, a, another comment, and it bears on, on something that uh, both Sandy and, and Tony said about sort of the elite, elite institutions versus others in this country. One of the things that I think is great about higher education in America is, like, is that unlike at least a few of our fellow countries, you can get a great in education and you can succeed in this country almost wherever you go to school. Um, there are cultures where if you don't go to one or two or three institutions, um, you are limited in, in terms of what you can expect in terms of your own level of accomplishment or achievement in that society. Not true in the US. There are people who are wildly successful in every realm of accomplishment. Can we say, less, to, can we say less true in the US? Less true in the US. Not true in the US. <clears throat> but I but mean, look, Ivy, I, having an Ivy League degree definitely helps. It, it, but look, you have people who are wildly successful who've gone to the great public universities no, all over the country. That's true, but. Um, you know, I was proud when I was president of Tufts <laughs> to say that three of the Fortune, you know, uh, 50 CEOs were Tufts right. graduates. I mean, you could, people go everywhere in this. No. It's not like some places in the world yeah, I'm where... I'm just trying to say it matters a bit, not, not at all, that's all. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> suggesting it doesn't matter at all. But, Otherwise, you'd be in real trouble. <laughs> but, a, again, I'm a great... Having grown up in Michigan, um, I am a great proponent of public higher education. Uh, and I think one of the tragedies, which we haven't talked about up here is the degree to which the states have systematically disinvested in their support for public higher education, have shifted the burden of attending college from the taxpayer to students and their families, and it's accounted for you know, escalating uh, cost of attendance at these institutions and escalating debt. I just wanted to pick up one of the things that I think certainly that Sandy touched on, but it relates perhaps to the uh, aristocracy point that Tony made too. The reasons why we might focus so intensely on elite institutions, in particular somewhere like Harvard, you might think of various reasons. One could be Sandy's point about success, which is conditional on getting into Harvard. Very good chance you're going to get through, yes. you're going to graduate, and a very good chance you're going to do well afterwards. And so actually, actually they, it's a successful institution, so we want as many people as possible to share in that success. Right now, there's a very strong, as you know, socioeconomic gradient who has that success. The second could be that even though the numbers are small, you provide a disproportionate number of people into very powerful positions, think tanks, judiciary, journalism, et cetera. And so even if the numbers... Leaders of other educational like, institutions. Yeah, so you're a pipeline of the kind of future leaders, et cetera, to a greater extent perhaps than a mm -hmm. bigger public one. That could be it. And then thirdly, symbolically, that as this kind of old institution, that actually the extent to which it feels like an American institution, an institution for America, rather than just for some Americans. So there's those different reasons why we might actually be putting the spotlight on you. And do you think that's fair enough on all three counts? You're successful, you provide a lot of leaders, and, and, and you're American? And we take our responsibility to try and serve the nation um, more broadly quite seriously. Uh, it's why we've invested in, in the creation of a nonprofit online educational system uh, through edX. And we've invested real money uh, to try and make these courses available. It's, it's why we've worked hard to try and ensure that any student who gets into Harvard can attend regardless of the ability of their parents to afford it. Uh, we are one of the few institutions that's fortunately for us, I mean, we're blessed with the resources to do this, but we are truly need blind when we admit kids. We don't look to see whether or not they can afford to come. Any student who enrolls at Harvard uh, who comes from a family with less than $65,000 a year in income. The family contributes nothing to their education. Uh, I'm not talking about just to their tuition. Tuition, room, board, fees, books, travel, they contribute nothing towards that. We cap the family contribution for those from the middle class at 10% of family income up to $150,000. So you can, if you qualify for financial aid, you can go to Harvard for less money than an in-state student can actually go to the University of California. Um, so now, not everybody's in the position to do what we do. We're trying to do what we can, and we spend a lot 
trying to make sure that students understand that they have these opportunities. Um, so we, we take this responsibility seriously. Can we do more? Sure. Uh, we're trying to do more. Mm. Uh, and we're trying to also partner with other institutions around the country to achieve that. I'd actually like to let the panel back in on, on that point specifically, um, and, and in fact on anything that's kind of come up, but I do want particularly Sandy uh, and Tony for the chance of this, the issue of the challenge of being seen as elitist, and that's partly the socio-demographics, it's partly the profile and so on, and this issue around kind of success, more, catering mm -hmm. more broadly, sure. uh, and the aristocracy point that Tony made, but Sandy, so you first. I feel like <clears throat> listening to the two of you, I mean, the problem is that we get into this sort of extremist kind of situation where is how important is it for Harvard and similar institutions to educate a broader swath of the population? It's important. There's no question about it. It's mm. important. But relative to the problems that we face in higher education, right. <clears throat> excuse me, relative to the challenges of social mobility, it's small. And I think actually what Harvard can contribute is much bigger than just how many Pell Grant recipients enroll at Harvard, partly through its other um, uh, parts of its mission and partly through what it does with its resources. But we as a society have got to focus on the harder problems, and I think Harvard can help with them. How do we make sure that public institutions, that community colleges mm -hmm. have the resources that they need? How do we make sure, because there are lots of people who go to colleges that do not serve them well, and we give them federal money to go to those institutions where no one graduates. So we have a much bigger responsibility, and it's almost easier to say, Harvard, you fix the problem. You've got all that money, and you do have all that money, and you could do a mm -hmm. lot with all that money, but we, we can, do a lot with all that let money. up, okay. but we well, need to stop saying that, and, and elitism, as you said, the football example, right? Like, it, it's great to be, we want these institutions to be selective, to provide valuable educational opportunities to high achieving students who can come from all different backgrounds, but that can't be our main focus. So what, just be, let me push on that a bit, Sandy. I, I think we all completely agree with you. Um, and actually, if you use the, the Brookings definition of the middle class, middle 60%, the modal institution that those kids go to if they go to college is a community college, mm -hmm. right? So in terms of the numbers, I absolutely agree. But as we've got Larry with us on the panel, um, after having heard, what do you think Harvard could be doing to help those other institutions, to help the higher education system more generally? You just said it could use its resources, et cetera. So there are lots of resources. Harvard has money, reputation, connections, et cetera. How do you think they could be using it more effectively? Well, I mean, the first thing is that I think that they do a lot. I mean, educating students, educate students who are going to go out and make a difference in the world, who don't have the goal of just maximizing their own incomes, but of making the world a better place and increasing opportunities is terrifically important. I'm sure that Harvard, Harvard does everything it can for its own students. It would be great if Harvard decided it was going to do a lot more for students who grow up in Cambridge who are never going to get to Harvard. Right. Who that, that's, and I know Harvard does some of these things, but I think that so it requires thinking broadly. I don't think that having the federal government tell Harvard how to spend its money is going to solve the problem. Um, I think that that sort of you know expanding and helping them to think about what they can do in terms of contributing to the people who are going to make the world a better place is Thank important. You. Thank you. Tony. It's not just Harvard, uh, and I do agree with the sentiment here. That is, I'm from an elite institution that just got there a few years ago, Georgetown. It wasn't a long time ago. Uh, when you get there, you hang on to it, let me tell you. So uh, the... <laughs> the top ten, right? I don't know if it is or it isn't, but everybody's very proud of wherever we are. So uh, <laughs> there is a... Uh, and I get that. I, it's also a Jesuit institution. So we pray over a lot of things. Um, and one of the things we pray over is the fact that we're an elite institution. And that's <laughs> often you got a lot of guilty Catholics running around. So you pray to stay in the elite institution, but also you're wrapped with guilt Absolutely. about being elite. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> it's perfect. Uh, so perfect. Guilt is the price of success. If, so in any way, I think the... Uh, but there is a larger point here about selectivity. And that is that if you take the top 500 colleges in the rankings in... The U.S. News is it the U.S. News rankings, uh, and you look uh, at those, you see the same thing. That is, the American system now is very reliably reproducing generations. Uh, now, you know, uh, class and race uh, in opportunity does not begin with the college admissions right. officer. It started right. a long time before right. that. But we do the great sorting of Americans between high school and college. That's when everybody lines up and goes their separate ways. 
Uh, and in the end, what we've built is a system. Used to be in the 1970s, 75 percent of Americans uh, had high school only, and they were doing fine. That was when America was great, and we want to be great again, apparently. So the, in the end, the, uh, we now live in a world that has flipped so that you now require post-secondary education and training, except for maybe 20 percent of high school graduates. So, uh, we've, so what we've done is we've added another brick on the wall which is the selectivity in the higher education system, which very reliably reproduces uh, the educational uh, inequality in K-12 education and projects it into the labor market and starts all over again in the next generation. Yeah. That is the larger problem. And I, my, uh, and I do agree with Sandy that fixing that probably yeah. uh, means dumping more money into the institutions yeah. below that. And that's a problem across the entire system, right, even though we're focused kind of right now. Uh, Michelle, I just want you to come in, come in um, particularly on any of these issues you've heard of, but the 32 million you were talking about seems like relates to this issue of openness, or are you sitting there thinking, we've really just got to go much more radical on this and break open, bust open the wall? Well, I actually was curious to hear from you, Larry, um, what Harvard's, as we think about sort of different mental models for the future, um, just because the problems ahead are quite vast and one of them is this huge uh, sorting mechanism that, that reproduces social stratification. But I'm wondering at, at more of a, just a teaching and learning level, um, sort of the thoughts around, you know, you mentioned continuing education and executive education as a way to return to learning. But again, these are models that are fixed around our credit hour system, right, which really doesn't do a whole lot in terms of measuring people's ability to do things, right? And as we talk about the need for skills and, and employers deeply in search of skills, I'm wondering how you think about sort of competency-based education or mastery-based education as opposed to sort of continuing our reliance on the Carnegie unit, which kind of drives everything that we do. Mm. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are there. Uh, Paul LeBlanc is a friend. Uh, you know, who runs Southern New Hampshire University, which has been on the forefront of competency-based um, education. Now, I, I think we need to push models like this. I mean, again, one of the things that's great about the higher education system in the United States is its diversity, and one size does not fit all. And so um, we need to be experimenting with that. As Sandy says, not everybody's going to go to places like Harvard or places that even look like Harvard. Uh, so I'm all in favor of more experimentation. Um, uh, so I, I support that idea. Um, it's, you know, I, I want to return to something that Sandy said, though. It, if we're going to, four out of five kids in the United States are, are going to be educated at public institutions, right? At a most basic level, we need to think about how we're going to support those institutions going forward. Um, and again, I want to go back to a conversation that right now is, is rooted domestically, but we live in a global market for talent. And in a time in which other countries are investing in their university systems, um, especially investing more public money in their university systems, more public money in the research university systems, seeking to become more like us, uh, we in many cases have been disinvesting in support, again, for the, for the big state institutions where the bulk of the students are going to go in the United States, as well as these are also research universities and are engines of economic growth. And I just want to point out that we keep talking about undergraduate education exclusively up here. We haven't touched on, um, on graduate education or the research function, which is an important piece of what we all do. And well, I, I think you made that point really clearly. And actually, I wanted to press you a little bit on the connection you made between the two. So one reason we might not, from an access point of view, one reason we might not worry so much about graduate education is that conditional on your undergraduate education, right. there's basically no class gap in moving on to graduate small, but nothing like the same thing. Um, and the research thing, I think we just take, I think we take that point. But you said that you had something very evocative. You said we need to be, in we need to make sure we don't kill the goose that laid the golden egg. Now, if I understood the metaphor correctly, the golden egg is the research, the goose is the university. And the thing that might kill it is something we're going to do to admissions. Well, what did you mean I, by that? I wasn't just focusing on admissions. I was, so, um, I was might, focusing on a goose, series though? of policies which you know, emerge from time to time, which have um, serious consequences 
for our ability to be competitive in a world market for talent. Um, you know, uh, we are subject at the moment to an endowment tax, for example, um, where uh, it will have big consequences for an institution okay. like ours. Um, there was discussion at various times um, recently, and we worked very hard to keep this out of the tax bill, of uh, you know, taxing tuition wa waivers for graduate students, which would have had a huge consequence for our research competitiveness in the United States. Right. So there, there are a variety of things that come up. I could give I, you no, more no, no, examples. I see, but, uh, um, but none there of that was a, there was a, There was a proposal to cap indirect cost recovery, which, by the way, if we, beyond what we do right now, which would have huge consequences for undergraduate education. Because if you ask, you know, um, the way the system works, for those who aren't aware of it, is that all of us get audited periodically, and we basically allocate our costs between our research function and the educational function. And then the federal government, for every dollar of direct costs on a research grant, reimburses us for the proportionate indirect costs of the university that are committed to the research enterprise. If you say that the federal government's not going to support those anymore, the library doesn't go away. We still have to support that. It winds up getting supported on the educational budget, not on the research budget. So there are consequences for undergraduate education based upon how we solve these other problems. That's why I say they're joint products. People have to look at them in an integrated way. But we shouldn't, uh, so we shouldn't in any way misunderstand your comment to mean that if, you, if Harvard did become somewhat more um, balanced in terms of its socioeconomic... Uh, and we're it working it, hard to become... Research. Again, research. We, are, we work hard to try and identify those students and recruit them regardless of the, yep. the abilities of their families yep. to pay. But it's not opening study. up undergraduate admissions is not the thing that's going to kill the goose. Just want to be absolutely clear. No, no, right I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that. But, right. okay. but no. just let me make yeah. one point about Other that. policies that are coming out of this... Sure, sure. Yeah, I you know, to be clear. ...will have consequences so, for us. If you have a 1,400 cut score... Uh, SAT, you mean? SAT, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. ACT, SAT. Uh, although in columns cut scores, every elite institution really does have them. Uh, if you just take the average score of the students who are incoming and subtract the athletes and a few other people, you got the cut score. So in the end, um, the reality of this is that if you score 1,100 on the SAT, or I think that'd be like 24 on the ACT, the college admissions test. That is, if you're a slightly above average student in an American high school, you have almost an 80% chance of graduating for one of the top 500 colleges, or one of the top 130, by the way, mm. same number. Mm. Uh, and you, but you will never go there. It's not going to happen. Right. So unless you can throw a football, play a tuba, something. Right. Yeah. So, you know, there is a... Um, the overuse, the whole system essentially hides behind uh, what is essentially a, an, a technical dodge, uh, which is that test scores and the usual metrics uh, of, uh, that are used in college admission, and in the end, the test score is the anchor. Uh, it, it is sort of a shiny scientific object that covers over what is essentially an elitist bent. That is, is true. Is it more valuable for Harvard to have all people with 13, 1400 test scores or whatever, uh, or to have a slightly lower graduation rate <laughs> and serve much broader social purposes okay. in terms so of. So we've, spelt, we've we spent millions of dollars defending against the lawsuit, mm -hmm. that I think many of you are aware of, mm -hmm. in which we've made the case that admissions, that we are all more than just our numbers, that it shouldn't be reduced to just one's grades and SAT scores. Um, and to make this point to folks who would argue otherwise, I always say, and let's, let's, let's collect some data here in real time, may I? Go for it. Everybody who's ever hired anybody in this room, raise your hand. You ever hired anybody? Okay, for those of you who've hired people, how many of you have ever hired somebody without checking their references, without checking their work product, without interviewing them? How many of you ever hired people exclusively based on their grades and their SATs? I don't see any hands going up. And there's a reason for that, that we are all more than just our test scores. We have taken that position because we have folks who are trying to drive us to do admissions purely on the basis um, of grades and SATs, and we're resisting that. I mean, there are countries that do that. 
There are. Uh, so and what's interesting is that they right. have, um, they, their record in identifying leaders across all realms of accomplishment are not nearly as good as ours. So actually, I'm going to open up now, if people on the panel don't mind, because it's a great conversation thus far. I will just say one thing about, I think, your point about K-12. I didn't want that to be lost, because I think we have to recognize that the higher education system is presented with huge inequalities, um, which precede it. The question, I think, at hand is whether what, what it can and should be doing to reduce those inequalities that are presented to it. And I think one of the reasons why it's reasonable not always to say that is because I was at an event with high school uh, leaders last, uh, last week, and they tend to say, well, by the time they get to us, you know, it's all happened in middle school. And then I'm sure if you go to middle school, you know, it's all happened in elementary school. And elementary school will say, it's really about pre-K, so we've really got to get pre-K. And then pre-K teachers will say, oh, my God, it's all about the home and kind of families. And it's about it's the parents, and then the parents blame the schools. And so actually there is this, um, I think this, it's a real challenge to all of us, I think, to try and think about the world in a way which allows no one to be at fault, but everyone to be responsible. And this danger of always wanting to say, well, ah, it's then, it's them, it's then, it's then. Of course, it's everything. Of course, it's every single step of the way. So that's a kind of mild defense of the fact that we can focus on what is higher education doing, recognizing it has inequalities presented to it, and then do the same with high schools and the same with everybody else. Because every step of the way, we see inequalities. And everybody on every step has to do their bit. Would you agree? Is that a fair comment? Are you going to yeah, yeah, I would agree. But we do K through 12 education differently in this country than lots of others. Um, I think others do it better. Interestingly, um, what I think makes higher education successful in the United States relative to other countries is its diversity, is the competition you know, for students, for faculty, for resources, for mindshare. Um, and that competition, public institutions, private institutions, highly specialized institutions, comprehensive, that leads to innovation, um, and, and that's good. Um, we, um, in, in, uh, you know, I, I had a sabbatical in Amsterdam uh, for a year, and it was interesting. The Dutch, you know, at the higher education level, you know, everything is pretty much defined by the federal government. There's no, relatively little competition, relatively little innovation. K through 12 system, it's also defined by the federal government. And as a result, there's equality of resources per student across um, the country. And as a result, there's more equity mm -hmm. um, at, in the K through 12 system. In the US, we finance K through 12 education yeah. largely local, you know, through the property tax. Yeah. It reinforces inequality. Yeah. Um, you don't have the opportunity to do things at scale, okay, and to diffuse innovation in different ways. It's much harder uh, to do that. So the same competition um, that, that gives us great higher education in this country you know, we have decentralization at the K through 12 level, and it produces something which is inferior to the rest of the world. So I would right, just make that you. observation. All right, let's, let's um, open it up. I think there are microphones. Are there microphones? The gentleman here on the front row. Um, if people don't mind, I might take two or three, yeah, if that's OK with the panel. And if you don't mind saying who you are, and please make it a short question, or at least having a kind of rising inflection in your voice towards the end. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Steve Winters, um, independent consultant. I have to confess, uh, back in the 60s, uh, I got married as an undergraduate. My ex, now ex-wife was a student at Harvard. I was to very closely uh, connected uh, and aware of her, the programs. What a wonderful education. You know, she was in Robert Lowell's poetry seminar, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but from the standpoint of a globalized world and, you know, global citizens, and looking back on it, that was such a narrowly ingrown focused program that did not prepare anybody or, or her in particular to be to be a global citizen. Now I've heard that in the meantime, in the decades to come, actually Harvard has changed its emphasis and they're trying to prepare people that. So, so since the topic is the future, uh, what is the future for preparing global citizens? And of course, other countries talk about this too. Well, I'd rather go back to the past if I could have a Robert Lowell poetry class. Sure. Okay, um, uh, then the gentleman there, and then the lady right in front. So, yes, you, and then, yeah. and then I'll come all, back to the panel. All the controversy about... Sorry, do you mind telling us who you are? Uh, Stephen Trachtenberg. Um, all the controversy about Asians and, uh, and Harvard has made me curious about where people who don't get into Harvard actually go. Has anybody done any study of that? Mm, okay. 
maybe Sandy will know the answer to that question. And then if you just pass the microphone forward or uh, run it forward to just two rows in front of you, the lady, two rows in front of you. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Huri Kaliliana. I'm a patent attorney. And please forgive me if I'm not very versed in the matter of uh, educational issues. But one thing I've, uh, I've noticed is that I wish, I mean, I thank you very much, of course, for the panel, wonderful discussion. But I felt we are still living in the past. I feel we are not talking enough about the future. And uh, technology, technology, technology are the words in my head. When I look at high school students that are hacking each other's Instagram accounts and the way that the new generations in the primary school and, and high school are, are dealing with technology, I feel if Harvard or other universities would like to be competitive and they have students running to them, in fact, mm -hmm. the parents would probably pay any amount of money for these students to be educated for the demand of the marketplace today. And okay. if you really think about question? that, that's, that's one thing. Okay. But this one time tangential issue, we I don't think really I will leave that. I will I'm leave afraid. that. I'm yes. sorry. We'll Thank have to you very much. But so I've got, um, are you preparing people for global citizenship? Where do they go if they don't get into Harvard? And then are you doing enough around technology? I'm definitely hoping Sandy will jump on the second and that Michelle will jump on the third as well. But Larry, do you want to take first crack? Um, on global citizens, well, 20% of our students now come from outside the US. It's astonishing the proportion of students at Harvard that have an international experience. Well, when they're there, there was a time in which Harvard discouraged that. Said, why would you want to study abroad if you can spend all four years at Harvard? We've gotten past that. So I think we're doing a better job. Good. All right. Um, Sandy, where, uh, where do people who don't, who apply and don't get in go? Someone at Harvard knows exactly where the people who yeah. got in went yeah. instead. Yeah. But the people who applied to Harvard, most of them went to college someplace and some, probably a four-year college. But the people who got into Harvard and didn't choose to go to Harvard, most of them went to <laughs> Yale or Stanford. But a yeah. few of them accepted some scholarship close to home. I mean, it is hard to get people who are from certain cultural backgrounds to go across the country to go even to Harvard. But most of them are fine. And I think yeah, the, the basic point right. here is it's not Yale or jail. I mean, the, no. the point is no. that... It's Yale or UCLA or Yale. Yeah. Or yeah. Yeah. But it's, the, the yeah. other point is that there are different, in terms of ethnic groups, uh, Asians are oversubscribed in all elite college applicant pools, uh, which I think in a way sets up one of the problems that Harvard's having. Uh, which is, not to say that it resolves it, but it sets it up. So the Asians have a much higher efficiency rate in going to elite colleges. If you took the American system and lined everybody up by test score and let them all go to the elite colleges, the people, the largest groups, uh, there would be very substantial shifting uh, in people who are in the elite colleges. Uh, and mostly what would happen... Uh, would be that Asians would lose seats, African Americans would lose seats, Latinos would lose seats, uh, whites would lose a ton of seats, uh, but they would be replaced by other whites. So uh, it's one of the ironies of the, I don't know how, in this case, all I know are the numbers about pools and admissions, but it does raise, uh, it's a complicated question. Yeah, I imagine Larry's not going to say very much about the case. At least while that camera's rolling. You're correct. Um, so <laughs> anything on the, te on the techno yeah, technology Yeah, real quick on point, the technology right? front. Um, so yes, technology is, is obviously um, hugely important. Um, the fascinating thing is if you look at a lot of the folks who are actually attending some of the coding boot camps, many of them are college graduates who have majored in computer science who don't know how to do the practical application of coding. And so they're actually learning it through this kind of finishing school approach. So that, that's just like one, one, one interesting thing that's going on. At the same time, you have to remember that as much as technology is, is, is key, there's this increased demand from the employer side for these uniquely human skills. We just see it in the job postings data. And David Deming writes a lot about this as mm -hmm. well. It is a skill that is increasingly uh, coming, in, coming to the fore because there are just certain things we're going to have to relinquish to the robots and computers that will do it better than we can. But then we're going to have to have this layer of ethics and judgment and values to complement that work. And then just real quick on, um, uh, on, on technology and, and just sort of one of the most powerful things that actually um, a woman who runs the engine in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. which is an incubator yeah. for billion dollar kind of venture startups Time that are solving yeah. huge 
huge problems like fusion, right? Um, she said, we haven't had a moonshot since 1970. And we don't have these moonshots in STEM anymore that, that really inspire young children to get excited about the work that they can accomplish. And what's challenging is, as we talk about the K-12 um, system, is that so many of the students start opting out as early as the fifth grade in terms of thinking that they are capable of doing STEM opportunities. But if we inspire them with these large-scale projects and things that, that, that many of our STEM our math and our greatest math and science teachers in elementary schools just have no grasp of. We don't that there's a there's a real disconnect there. We don't have these mechanisms to inspire and that's that to me just sort of has resonated. Thank you. Let's do another round. Maybe that. Um, Abigail, as we know, the Larry Summers, the ex-Harvard University president, uh, he started up the uh, Manaver. Uh, this is the innovative the college. So I want mm. to know where these innovative the universities will lead the next uh, the trend in the 20 years. And can you give us some the features or outlook about the, the future of the universities? Is, do you know about, about the Minerva this? project? The Minerva, Minerva project? Do you know about this? I know about Minerva. Okay, fine. Um, and where that's going to lead. And then right there at the back, yeah, you've already got the mic. Yeah, uh, Lizia, the National Science Foundation. Um, uh, is the idea of a major still current? And should it be replaced and by what? Okay, well, what do you think it should be replaced by? It sounds, I mean, I know I said ask questions, but you're clearly. No, no, no I don't need to make a comment. Oh, I, all right, just, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> um, and then actually, let's go over here. The gentleman over here in the green shirt. Yeah. And if we're quick about this, we can do another round in. So, here you go. Yeah, my name is Kim. I'm from Maxwell School, Syracuse University. So, yeah, it's a great discussion. So my question is, uh, some of the leading uh, university institutions in the US, they have played a very great role in public diplomacy. So my question is, if we just go through the rough survey and most of the international organizations are all leading that organization, that most of the people, they are graduates from some of the leading institutions. So in that case, so uh, to improve the public institutions, public institutions in U.S., what is the role of these, some of the leading institutions that private leading institutions like Harvard or other... To, to help other institutions. Yeah. To yeah. Thank okay, good. Um, so we've got the Minerva, and where does that, what does that mean for the kind of future higher education? Should we get... What is the future of majors? Something else? Um, and then this kind of question about what Carver could be doing to help other public institutions. You kind of touched on already, Larry, but again, do you mind having first crack? And so Minerva, the jury is still out. Minerva is a, um, a startup. Uh, <laughs> the idea was to create a, an institution which required of its undergraduates to actually do residencies, in effect, in multiple cities around the world, but taking all of their content online in those cities. Yeah. And they've yet to graduate their first class, and we'll see how it works out. So, jury's still out on Minerva. Okay. Um, um, you want me to take the major question? Well, I think I do, yeah. So, uh, um, I will tell you, I think that there's virtue in having students do depth in something. Uh, because it's important to understand issues and subjects at a level of complexity so that you actually appreciate your own ignorance when it comes to other fields. Uh, and not just have a superficial understanding of, of, of everything. So, um, uh, I'm in favor of students concentrating, as we say at Harvard, majoring at other institutions. I think one of the things it also does is provide a guided pathway yeah. through students. I think a lot of the work on community colleges, which people in this room know yeah. better than me, suggests that sometimes that's lacking in other institutions, yeah. which is this clear sense of here's a path, do this, do that, don't yeah. do this. But I would also say that, um, at least in institutions like ours, it often doesn't matter all that much what you wind up concentrating in in terms of what you do with your future life. I used to give a welcoming speech to entering students when I was at Tufts in which I, I addressed this issue by describing what people who were graduates of the place were doing now and what they, what they majored in when they were at Tufts. And okay. Sandy, One other point about, right, about, about Sandy, majors, I want you to uh, and that is that they, may, they matter a lot. Uh, and for, it's one of the distinctive... For what happens later, you mean? For your earnings. Yeah, Let's yeah. go right to a, a, a metric. Uh, the, and that is something that's changed in American higher education. So that two things happened since the 70s. One is that the value of college, say the BA or any level of college beyond high school, went up. The so-called wage premium over high school. 
The other thing that was even more radical was that the differences among majors quintupled so that now we live in yeah. a world where you can get a certificate in heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, one of my favorites, uh, and, and you can earn more than a BA, and many people with a graduate degree. So about 55% of people at the BA level work in their major. The variation in earnings is yeah. huge. If you're a major in petroleum engineering, you'll make about 120 grand a year. If you major in psychology and don't get a master's degree, you'll make about 30 grand a year. So major, yeah, that is one of the major changes in higher education. Okay, Sandy, I don't know if you're going to want to respond to this, but the specific question about how to help other institutions, because you did say you wanted Harvard to do more to help those other institutions, but I'm not sure. Well, I, I actually just want to say right. that, well, first let me just say that this issue of majors, yeah, yeah. obviously Larry's right and you're right because it's different. I mean, if you go to Harvard and what you, whether you major in English or math is going to make a lot less difference than in the data that you're looking at nationally and where everybody goes and whether they major yeah. in engineering or not. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that what we can do, there is a huge political necessity for people to understand the value of higher education and the importance that we pay taxes in order to subsidize higher education. And Harvard can has a, a, a public voice and can talk about that and can make sure that its students understand that and that it has to do with them even though they're at a private institution. Oh. Just offer a different tack on the earlier question around the whether majors matter and also the Minerva project. One of my favorite, so Stephen Coslin, who was of the Harvard faculty and, and ran part of the Minerva has now left, one of his um, favorite examples to talk about sort of the, the sort of transfer from knowledge to application of knowledge. Uh, was he would give this example of Eric Mazur's class at Harvard where he was once, te once teaching a physics class and he was using all kinds of baseball metaphors to illustrate all these different parts of physics. On the final exam, he ran out of, uh, he ran out of baseball questions. And so he did something with football or basketball. I can't remember what. And the, the <laughs> students threw a fit because they said, have <laughs> been teaching us baseball this whole time, don't understand how this relates uh, to, you know, to this other field. And he was talking about the, the challenges of near and far transfer. And I think one of the things is, I completely agree in terms of the, the importance of majors and the depth that you, you gain, but I think we have a real opportunity to rethink some of the siloing of our learning so that we help our learners understand that problems don't exist in departments, right? We don't just simply solve the math problem. And so a lot of the developments going on in grand challenges and problem-based mm -hmm. learning is just a really interesting opportunity for us to rethink some of our learning models. And actually, that's where K-12 is doing a, a slightly better job than we are in higher education. So I think those kinds of things are exciting to see. So as always, as always, demand is outstripping supply mm -hmm. in terms of the time we have available and the panel that's here. So um, the apologies to those who didn't get to ask our questions directly. We'll stay in touch. Um, I, I just want to uh, quote from Larry's um, speech. One of the things I most appreciated about it, despite some of the challenges that you're facing, is you said that we ignore these criticisms at our peril. This is a moment in history where the value, purpose of higher education is being scrutinized and questioned in a way that it hasn't, done, hasn't been for some time. And I think that for higher, edu higher education not only to survive but to continue to flourish, it needs leaders who face those criticisms and accept those criticisms rather than hide from them. So I think that the framework you've given us is a great way forward. And I would just like, on behalf of Ryan and AI and Brookings and myself, um, to thank Larry for your comments and the panel for your responses. All of you for coming. Please join me in thanking Larry and our panel. <laughs>